welcome back. And now we're heading into a super key topic area, regardless of your company or your tech focus, security. So please welcome our next speaker, who is a hybrid multi-cloud fellow. He's going to talk about how to check your security posture. So welcome Jason Queck, the global CTO of Devo Team Google Cloud. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining my session today. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about a very important topic about checking your security posture in Google Cloud. So first of all, I'd like to give a bit of background. Where did we come from and why, why I'm on this stage talking about this? So when we first moved to Google Cloud, uh, we decided that we were going pure cloud native. The number one priority for us was developer eligibility. So how do we get the productivity to build products and applications on the cloud as fast as you can and as cleanly as you can. And we also had to combat the ch changing cloud landscape with continuous new features and uh, releases like you see in the cloud next uh, all the time. So understanding what to use and what not to use in our uh, cloud landscape. So Devil Team G Cloud is a Google Cloud Managed Services partner with a global presence, which means that we are present in 18 countries. So which means also different, different kind of regulations and different kind of rules they have to apply for all customers that sit across the globe. And it's not an easy thing to do. And uh, we also have to pass different things like the audit. So to become a managed services partner in Google Cloud, you actually get audited by Google itself. And that's kind of stressful at times. So in one section, it's about security. How do you maintain a good security posture so that you can give secure, uh, peace of mind to your customers? We also have many specializations. And in which of them, they go through our security posture and validate that we are secure, and uh, we are poised to, uh, for success. So it can feel hard to create a secure cloud environment because there's so many rules, there's so many features, things like orga organization policies, things like security command center, things like IAM rules. So it can feel hard at times to what do you enable and what do you disable in your cloud environment. So a bit of uh, context as well. In 2018, we started on Google Cloud with what I call the Cloud Foundations. So building what the typical landing zone uh, with the different kind of uh, governance in place. Next, we moved to GKE and utilized that to great effect. We got into GitOps and we started with Anthos. And 2020, that's where we achieved uh, managed services provider status so that we can give that kind of uh, extra service to our customers. And next, we build things like accelerators in a different, different workloads. Now, so in, back in 2018, just to bring you back a couple of years ago, like four years back, there was a few different requirements we had to look at our landing zone, right? First, we had to work on this different, different customers, proof of concepts. So you are building different POCs, you are building different kind of customer environments. So you had to build a multi-tenant strategy. Secondly, we wanted to test out new features on Google Cloud to be ahead of the curve, to understand what is going to be the next trend in the market and what should we get ahead of to learn. And next, we want to do it as automated as possible. Because as you want know, there's a big lack of talent uh, in the Google Cloud market. We need much more developers, much more cloud architects in the market to get Google Cloud really running as smooth as possible. So as a, as a byproduct, automation is key. Next, we want to make it intuitive and easy to navigate. For example, if we want to onboard a new engineer, they should be able to look at the cloud landscape and understand where to go, how to navigate, and how to build things. So it should be as close to best practices as possible so that we do not have to reinvent the view. And next, last thing, and finally, is to be secure because we cannot lose information and data, right? So with that, we looked around the five, uh, the six main topics. So we think like governance, networking, logging, monitoring, security, billing, because for example, billing is actually the key part of security as well, how to prevent bill shock. We had to make it multi-tenant with different customers sitting in different environments, as well as our own sandbox environments for our developers. As, uh, as, uh, and also, we run internal applications for customers as well. So you can imagine it's a very large multi-tenant environment with different regulations, different kind of uh, rules for different countries. So it's uh, quite a sprawling landscape. So we sit almost across three organizations, if you, if you know the organization node in Google Cloud. Thousands of projects, hundreds of folders. 
So in 2020, we, we took a step back because that was where really the cloud really boomed. And we said that, okay, we need to identify which technologies were really key to get on board so that we can leverage and accelerate. So first of all, we say that, okay, we're going to go with Terraform, right? We're not going to go with Cloud Deployment Manager. So to kind of adopt an open, <laughs> open way of working. I see some last in, in the audience. <laughs> uh, we looked at things like Cloud Build, Argo CD, which we found that really fit the, uh, the way we work, uh, that, that creative way of working. And we came across also this idea of the Google Cloud Foundations, right? And what is Google Cloud Foundations? This is where we realized that we had to use this uh, great tool that was produced as open source. It's called the Cloud Foundation Toolkit Scorecard. So remember the, the scenario we came from. We had a large, sprawling cloud landscape with multiple projects that fit meet multiple use cases, POC, sandboxes, production environments, staging environments, that you have teams in different countries building all the time and delivering all the time for over 2,000 customers. How do we score ourselves on security? So this is where this came in. Uh, I can recommend you can do that. So what you do is that uh, you can write what I call policies. So this is a very typical policy they can download from the, from the source repos. So it's a very simple one. It's just um, basically anybody that's not there at .com should never be older in, the, in, in your project. Very simple, very simple rule, right? Um, so with this kind of policies, um, I would want to do a walkthrough. So the first step, there's three easy way steps to do this, to check your cloud security posture today. So three easy steps to get, get rated. Number one, export your asset inventory. So understanding what sits in your cloud, right? Just simply run this gcloud commands. It's easy peasy. Uh, you get a list of all your service accounts, firewall rules, applications. Everything comes out in a huge JSON file. <laughs> it covers things like IAM rules as well as uh, yeah, resources. Next, you get your policy library from uh, Forseti Security. I'm not sure if anyone has implemented Forseti before. You can raise your hand. Yeah, Forseti, great, awesome. Yeah, it's, I, I really recommend it as well. It's a continuously check, checking your security posture. So there's a great base policy library here. So it gives you like the basic defaults, things like that, um, the owner rules, right? Clone it, and then just run this command, CFT scorecard, and you point to a policy path. And you, and you point to where your bucket sits, where you have your asset inventory. With that, you get a list of violations. And the violations as well will link to the different kind of rules that you, are, that, that you have implemented in your policy library. So how do we tackle all these different rules as well? Like, what do we start with first? So first, we tackle the IAM violations, because first, we want to make sure that no one's accessing the system that shouldn't be accessing the system, right? So throughout the experience with customers and with other people as well, like a simple thing like restricting the age of how long your service account key can live for. So for example, how many of you have service account keys that have been floating around? For example, if you have a new joiner there or a person that left the company and they bring along the service account key with them. So actually, if you don't have a rotation policy today, uh, this thing will just pop out as a violation. So you have a service account keys that has lived for longer than, for example, 100 days. This also then gives you an insight about what you have to fix and what policy you have to, you have to implement. So this could be maybe a missing process in your company onboarding and onboarding phase. So maybe developers should download a new key every two days, for example, from a bucket. So make sure that those keys will never be misused. Just let it, let it die. And so this was a, a typical constraint that we found out, OK, we have some service account keys that have been living for too long. We have to deprecate them and, re and rotate them. And also fix our processes, right? Next, we had to rethink the project creation process. So a lot of the kind of flaws that, or issues that we found in violations was actually due to this, how you create a project, right? That's actually a very simple thing to do. You go to the Cloud Console, you click Create Project, and you're done, right? <laughs> Like, for example, um, do you know that in, uh, when you create a new project, in the quotas page, BigQuery analysis is unlimited, for example. So any developer can create a project and can consume 20,000 worth of, of, of a BigQuery analysis cost within one day if they're not careful. So how do you do that in a way that uh, you can actually uh, be, make sure that you are as secure as possible? 
So we had to fix issues at the root. So we started writing additional um, constraints. So one of them, for example, is identifying cost, cost owners and countries of where they sit. So making sure that each project has its owner. And, and, and also have a, have a PR request rule so that when you try to create projects, it must be validated by the, per, the CTO of the country. So when we, scanned, when we scanned our cloud landscape as well, we found that there were many ways of labeling. There was not, uh, there, you, it's always hard to follow rules with, on Confluence, for example. When you, create a, you create a documentation, you say that everyone should do this the same way. Most of the time, it gets out of skew. So you need to still monitor it and see which of these things that you have documented down, whether the processes are followed. So trust, but always verify. Uh, so this is a way of verifying it. Next, we also had to think about reworking our modules. So remember, we, we chose Terraform, right? And we started to build with Terraform, and we started to use our modules, and we started to use a lot of open source Terraform modules. So we just grabbed get it off from, from GitHub, uh, from uh, yeah, Cloud Foundation, uh, and we started to use them when we want to go fast, right? That's why you leverage open source. But we realized that you cannot assume that open source actually automatically meets all your needs of each customer. And this is the reason why we had to create our own Terraform modules. They were specific to GKE, PubSub, ASM, for example, and to our service mesh. And I'll give you a bit of a, I'll give you an example why. So if you go to the next slide, like for example, in this, this is a, co a copy paste from a, a, pri a public GitHub repo for ASM. So in here, when you create an Entos service mesh on a GK cluster, you enable the GK hub feature in the same call, in the same module, right? Which means if you create five Entos service meshes across five clusters, and if you destroy one of them, it will disable the feature for the entire project. So this is the kind of things that you have to actually investigate when you look at open source as well to see that even though it is uh, it's something published open source, it's, it's public, it's, it's well tested, you have to see does it fit your need and can you understand what goes on underneath as well. And this is what we realized doing, doing our security posture check. So that's what I found out. So you only will discover this when you try to destroy the ASM. You realize that, oh, <laughs> suddenly the feature is disabled. Yeah. And lastly, we start to think about even extend it further and do definition of additional rules. So for example, we have many customers within uh, FSI, uh, healthcare, manufacturing, and all of them have different kind of data locality requirements, for example. So creating uh, uh, lo location violations, so understanding that some of the data sets can only sit in certain location, gives you a way to verify that your data should only be in a different area. And you can do the same thing for your GKA clusters, for your, your cloud storage buckets, and so on and so forth. So you can basically, if a developer does something wrong, they, can, they will be notified when you do the next scan, right? And this really make it very easy to, ap to adopt a policy as code approach, uh, which you find works better than merely ma maintaining a bunch of rules as documentation. So some of the learnings that we had. Uh, so there's a, a quote by Larry Page, uh, always work hard on something uncomfortably exciting. So why do I call it uncomfort comf uncomfortably exciting with security? Because honestly, who wants to look at your own security rules at times? Because you're worried, okay, I made something wrong, I did something wrong, I might be the reason for this uh, security breach. So it's very important to open up those, those problems and surface up to yourself, rather than letting some attacker or some, some out outside adversary discover it on your own. So it's uncomfortable, but do it. Do check your security posture. So, and also with open source systems. So when we look at our security posture as well, we found out that um, you know, a lot of CVEs are trying, uh, being updated all the time, how to deploy it. And as well as when we recommend an open source system to work on, we always have, we always have to understand, can we support this open source system ourselves? In the event that somebody stops supporting it, starts doing PRs, starts, fix, starts fixing, fixing bugs, can we go ahead and fix those bugs ourselves? And this is a great thing. We love open source, and we love to, we love to use it. But the thing is that if it goes away from this open source system, we'll be stuck on it, and it'll take a few months to migrate from it. So anything we pick and choose, we must go through a checklist, and we see, are we able to understand how can we support it? Can we explain how it works? 
So understanding and explaining how it works is very important as well. And can we extend it? So that can we add on to it? Is it something that's protected and you can't rebuild it? So next, uh, what's next in our uh, list of activities? So in 2023, we're going to start looking at things like Kubernetes Config Connector and OPA, Open Policy Agent. So like you see, the constraints is just defined on the screen. So Google has come up with a new way of working. Instead of using Terraform, you create Google Cloud Infrastructure as YAML files, right? And you deploy into KCC, which is then instantiate those resources on your cloud landscape. And then you use things like Open Policy Agent to block any misconfigured uh, infrastructure. And that could be a possibility. So it's always important to update on the, new, on the latest tech and see does it fit for us. But we cannot only protect from, uh, from attack at the source. We also have to do audits, which is why something like the, the Cloud Foundation Toolkit is always good to have, because you can audit at the end of the year to make sure that you are in, com in compliance. And also things like the Security Command Center. So there's another, another new feature that Google came out with, I think, last year that has a lot of these constraints that have defined for you with machine learning and also with the different benchmarks that you can easily purchase and, and deploy. But right now, we have our own policy library that we maintain and that we use to regulate our, our infrastructure. But it could be a good idea to go to those two in the end. So yeah, so it looks very similar. You're, you're creating uh, YAML files for, like, for example, constraint templates for PubSub. So and ensuring that you have the labels, yes, yeah, always labeled, and it's uh, a basically a gatekeeper. So ensuring that nothing gets gets sent in that's wrong. And with security command center, uh, you take things the next step. So always doing an asset inventory export. So the whole security posture is always around uh, your assets. Taking the export, trying to figure out is there has it has it been any misconfigurations and also do threat detection. So that's something that's also extra that we're looking at. And also what's nice is that it has the best practices there as well, like CIS, NST, which we have built in our policy libraries. But it's nice to have somebody updating it for us, like moving to a managed service of always something that we choose to do. Also with that, um, I end my session. My email is actually hidden by the round thing. <laughs> But if you want to drop me a mail to ask, talk about security or ask about our policy library, you know, well, who's happy to share? So it's jason.quack at devilteam.com. So feel free to drop me a message anytime. Yeah, I'd love to connect on LinkedIn as well. Thanks.